Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Distinguished guests, Congresswoman Presley, students, faculty, alumni, and friends, on behalf of our school, welcome to today's conversation, part two of our three-part discussion of anti-racism as health policy. Before we begin, I would like to thank our co-host, the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Thank you, Professor Kendi, for your partnership on this event. Today's event is also co-sponsored with the Rockefeller Foundation, Boston University School of Public Health, 3D Commission. And thank you to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel and the teams behind the scenes who made today possible. To those who are coming back from yesterday's session, welcome back. If you missed yesterday's session and you'd like to take a look at it, it's available on our website. To those joining us today for the first time, welcome. For those viewing on Zoom, we we'll invite you to contribute questions via the Q&A function of Zoom. Additionally, we invite you to continue the conversation on social media. We'll be live tweeting throughout the event on our Twitter at BUSPH. And if you have not done so already, we encourage you to sign up for our third and final session in the series tomorrow, where we will be delighted to be hearing from Senator Elizabeth Warren. These public health conversations are meant as places where we can come together as a community to engage with issues of consequence for health. Few issues are as consequential as those of race and racism in this country. The pandemic has brought racial health inequities to the center of the national conversation. Addressing them means speaking honestly about race to inform policies that can shape a better, healthier country. The schedule for today's event will be as follows. First, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley will deliver keynote remarks. We will then hear from our panel presenters, followed by a moderated discussion. We are very much looking forward to a robust exchange of ideas. It's now my great privilege to turn this over to my co-host for this program, Dr. Ibram Kendi. Dr. Kendi. Well, thank you so much, Dean Galea, and, and thank you and your colleagues at the, the BU School of, of Public Health for, for co-organizing this event with my colleagues at the BU Center for, for Anti-Racist Research. Much gratitude to all the panelists uh, who will be sharing their, their wisdom and insight with, with us later. And, and of course, much gratitude to all of you for, for joining us for this absolutely critical three-part event. It is now time to introduce our, our keynote speaker. She is an activist, a legislator, a survivor, and the first woman of color to be elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She is Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Throughout her career as a public servant, Congresswoman Presley has fought to ensure that those closest to the pain are closest to the power, driving and informing policymaking. Throughout her first term in Congress, Congresswoman Presley has been a champion for justice, reproductive justice, justice for immigrants, consumer justice, justice for aging Americans, justice for workers, justice for survivors of sexual violence, and justice for the formerly and currently incarcerated. And she's been a champion of health justice, a champion for people who are ailing in the shadows of society. Indeed, last year in late March, Congresswoman Presley was among the first members of Congress to call for racial demographic data on coronavirus patients, fearing what came to pass, the racial pandemic of disparities within the viral pandemic. She has said, policy is my love language because if we can legislate hurt and harm, then we can legislate equity and healing and justice. She helped introduce and reintroduce recently the Anti-Racism in Public Health Act to confront the historic and ongoing public health crisis that is racism. Currently, Congresswoman Presley serves on two powerful congressional committees, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform and the House Committee on Financial Services both of which have remained focused on legislatively addressing the issues of, issues of care, concern, and consequence to the American people. Prior to being elected to Congress, she served on the Boston City Council for eight years and was the first woman of color elected to the council in its 100 year history. I am deeply honored to be able to present to you my Congresswoman, the People's Congresswoman, Ayanna Presley. 
Wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Dr. Kendi. It's always good to sit at any virtual uh, table with you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join you for this much needed discussion. Um, Dr. Kendi, your scholarship really does continue to guide conversations throughout our nation on the importance of anti-racism. Uh, it is my humbling honor to call you a constituent and I'm so glad to be in virtual community with you and Dean Galea, who continues to be a consistent partner for my office in the Massachusetts Seventh uh, in the work of equity and justice. You know, the issue of anti-racism in public health is absolutely critical in the midst of the ongoing pandemic, but it was also important before and it will be important after. The work of anti-racism must be embedded in our work every single day. And with today's event, Dr. Kendi and Dean Galea are making that plain. The intersection of anti-racism, data and policy is not new. Black folk in our constant advocacy for equality, freedom and justice, we've been employing scientific data collection methods for decades. And we've had to use innovative tactics to secure the data. Now, on the heels of Black History Month and Women's History Month, which we know is really American history and so that's every day, but on the heels of those uh, months designated to their official uh, recognition, I want to bring into the space an ancestor and a pioneer in the space of, um, of using innovative uh, tactics to secure data and uh, bring in Ida B. Wells. Now, many will recall that just last year, she was posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize for her work as a civil rights advocate, journalist, and feminist. She is one of the founders of the NAACP and was unapologetic in speaking truth to power. In fact, people like Frederick Douglass sang her praises. In one letter he said, and I quote, Dear Ms. Wells, thank you for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination now generally practiced against colored people in the South. There has been no word equal to it in convincing power. I have spoken, but my word is feeble in comparison, brave woman. And her bravery dates all the way to 1862. Ida B. Wells, was born enslaved during the Civil War in Mississippi. During her formative years, her parents were active in the Reconstruction era and organized with the local Freedmen's Aid Society. Her father even helped found Rust College, an HBCU that Wells would go on to attend. Now, eventually she was forced to drop out when she lost both of her parents and one of her siblings to yellow fever outbreaks. She and her siblings moved to Memphis, Tennessee where she was a teacher and began her journalism career. At this point in American history, the brief reconstruction era was over and anti-black violence was prominent in the street, in the courtroom and codified in the law. Sounds very familiar. Thus, the black community was all she had. So in 1892, after her friend was murdered by a lynch mob an all too common experience for black folks in the South, Ida B. Wells committed her journalistic talent to investigating documenting and collecting data on lynchings throughout the South. She published her research in a pamphlet titled Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. It was remarkable and it was unprecedented. This was immediately after the abolition of slavery when racial tensions were high and white mob violence was rampant. There were no cell phones for emergencies and no legal recourse for harm. Despite these obvious and dangerous risks, Wells traveled from city to city and met with black community members to gather data on lynchings. And then she would publish her findings and openly call out white supremacy. Her courage and determination cannot be overstated. However, the backlash cannot be overstated either. After one of her articles, a mob of white Tennesseans ravaged her newspaper office and destroyed all of her equipment. Luckily, she was in New York and unharmed. In response to the attack, Ida B. Wells wrote an even more detailed report on lynching in America that was published by the New York Age, a newspaper run by freedmen, by a freedman. Her research was not simply for research sake. Wells used data to develop reforms and took her anti-lynching campaign directly to President McKinley. Although Ida did not live did not return to live in Memphis, she continued her journalism advocacy and research in Chicago. Now, as someone who was raised in Chicago, I'm proud of that commonality that she and I share. And I hope that um, I'm doing my part to honor the role that women like my mother, Sandy Presley, may she rest in peace and power and 
Black women, like my mother and I to be Wells, have honored throughout every social movement and throughout history. We have been the table shakers, we have been the disruptors, we have been the justice seekers, we have been the preservers of democracy. We have been the researchers, we have been the data collectors. And so I hope that I'm honoring uh, that tradition. But I'm so proud, given my Chicago roots, to have that in common with Ida B. Wells. And, but that's not the reason I'm telling her story today. I'm sharing this story so that it may serve as a guide to all of us. Ida B. Wells' approach to the intersection of anti-racism, data, and policy includes foundational principles that we must practice today. Now, Wells was rooted in community. She was detailed and she was bold. These three elements bolstered her advocacy and charted a path for generations to follow. So as we discuss anti-racism in public health and connecting data with policy, consider the way I legislate and the work we do in partnership, a testament and a love letter to Ida B. Wells and the researchers and advocates like her who were rendered, unfortunately, a footnote in the history books. An anti-racist approach to public health requires us to be rooted in community. We need to have an in-depth understanding of the people and work in close partnership with the public in order to create policy. I've often said those closest to the pain should be closest to the power, driving and informing the policy making. That means as elected leaders, it is our responsibility to work directly with the community and bring everyone to the process to create a government that works for all people. I stay in proximity to the hurt, for those closest to the pain. One, so that I remain acutely uncomfortable and never grow complacent in the work. Two, so that I can better understand the intersectionality and the nuance of those challenges. And three, so that I can develop the best solutions in partnership with those who are the real experts, those that are closest to the pain. So uh, this work, uh, that sort of approach, is one uh, that should be true for Congress and for our White House. It should also be true for mayors, city councilors, governors, and state legislators. At all levels of government, responsive policy is only possible when community is a part of the process. And community is especially relevant for public health. Culturally competent care is about community. Trauma-informed care is about community. Race-conscious care is about community. We must enact policy that meet people's needs. But how do we know what folks need? That is where the data comes in. Whether it's a multi-year study, a roundtable discussion, or a quick survey, data is a vital communication channel for addressing public health concerns. And to receive accurate data from the community, you have to be trusted. This is true in our everyday lives. We are less likely to share information with a stranger than we are with someone we know and trust. Ida B. Wells demonstrated this throughout her life's work. As she traveled across the South, she remained rooted in community, which was essential for her data collection. It could not have been easy for Black folk to discuss a recent lynching for fear they would be next. White mob violence was ruthless and relentless, but Wells, she managed to get people to confide in her. They trusted her. Her bona fides were known and respected because her journalism and advocacy never strayed from censuring the people. And the more work she completed, the deeper the roots. As the Congresswoman for the Massachusetts Seventh, the first person of color and the first black woman to ever represent the Commonwealth in the US House of Representatives in its 230 year history. I take that lesson with me everywhere I go. Whether I'm in Randolph, Somerville, Boston, or Chelsea, I prioritize remaining rooted in community to get the best data. I represent one of the most vibrant, diverse, and dynamic districts in the country, and one of the most unequal. We're in a three mile radius, life expectancy in my district drops from 92 years in the Back Bay to 59 years, that's the blackest part of my district in Roxbury, and median household income drops by $50,000. We're talking about a three mile radius. Life expectancy in the back bay is 92 and in Roxbury is 59. And that's before we even talk about the impact on life expectancy um, and the disparate impact on the black community because of the pandemic. And again, median household income drops by $50,000 with people of color holding the short end of the stick. 
Now the infant mortality rate for black babies in Boston is nearly five times higher than the rate for white babies with infants born in Dorchester and Mattapan having a lower birth rate than other areas in the city. These are statistics and data points that are helpful for understanding the big picture. Well, they're damning, uh, they're sobering. And, and I don't stop repeating these statistics to hold us accountable. I'm like, well, if you're tired of hearing them, imagine just how tired people are of living them. So the statistics matter, the data matters in order for us to get a big picture. But behind those numbers are people, stories, people who are struggling and who need change. By staying rooted in community, I know that a family holding only $8 in net worth in my district is likely a black family. And that is one that is also experiencing health inequities and needs reliable access to health care. That's why I'm such a proud advocate for community health centers. In fact, my district boasts more community health centers than any other district. I know in the Commonwealth for sure, but maybe in the country, I'm gonna take those bragging rights. And these facilities are lifelines, lifelines for low-income residents, uninsured folks, and Medicaid recipients. And most importantly, they are trusted by the patients they serve. Now, during this pandemic, community health centers have provided wraparound services, doing everything from prenatal care to COVID testing to mental health screenings. I stay connected to their work and rooted in community, which helps me better understand the challenges my constituents face, to build trust and to legislate the necessary changes to improve their lives. Without trust of the community, there can be no accurate data collection. Without accurate data collection, there can be no responsive policy. And without responsive policy, the harms of the status quo are replicated when people of color are forced to continue to shoulder the burden of everything. Anti-racism in public health requires us to be rooted in community. Additionally, it mandates that we are detailed when collecting data and creating policy. The health disparities that exist in my district and across the country did not happen by chance. They are not naturally occurring. They are a result of centuries of what I would characterize as policy violence. Policy violence enacted on communities of color and black Americans in particular. It's very precise. For those many years, there were many in power who were intentional and precise in legislating hurt and harm. So now we must be every bit as prescriptive and precise and intentional in legislating justice, in legislating equity, in legislating healing. When it came to data analysis, Ida B. Wells was known for her meticulous methods and detailed writings. The stories that she unearthed about the vicious lynchings of black people and terror of white supremacy expose hidden truths that previously went unreported. Local newspapers would often attribute the murders of black men as punishment for crimes they allegedly committed and bolster a false narrative that lynchings were acts of criminal justice. Sounds familiar. This was the justification that would be spread throughout towns in the South, up to newspapers and communities in the North, and to Congress and the White House. Wells' research publications corrected the record. She explained that criminality was a lie and after the fact justification. In fact, black people were lynched for being black and narratives created to distract and rationalize these cold-blooded murders abounded. Black men would be killed if someone thought they interacted with white women. The slaying of Emmett Till serves as a notable example. His young life was stolen based on a lie that he flirted with a white woman. Black people were often, often lynched if they challenged white economic control. Wells's friend and her friend's colleagues were lynched because they ran a successful grocery store, one that rivaled the white owned business in the town. But the reason reported by newspapers alleged criminal behavior. Thus to uncover the truth and root out racism, we must be detailed, precise, and speak plainly about the patterns of injustice that emerge. Over the past year, we've witnessed firsthand the pattern of destruction caused by COVID-19. People of color are dying at rates higher than white people. Communities of color are among the hardest hit during the pandemic due to longstanding policies which have adversely impacted generations. COVID-19 has exacerbated healthcare inequities and racial disparities in chronic health conditions. These disparities are a direct reflection of how pervasive structural racism and inequality have predisposed communities of color to comorbidities which heighten the risk of COVID infection 
hospitalization and death. But we would not have this information if it were not for detailed data collection. At the start of the pandemic, the CDC was only collecting demographic data related to age and gender. There was a growing narrative that older men were the most impacted, but I knew this was not true. I was hearing from folks in communities throughout my district and led calls for the government to begin collecting data on racial demographics. With my partner in good, Senator Warren, I introduced legislation to mandate equitable data collection and, and the disclosure of those who are contracting, being hospitalized and dying from the coronavirus. Key tenants of our bill were included in the CARES Act. And that is when we began seeing the true story. Black people across all ages are at least twice as likely to die from the disease compared to their white counterparts. My district, Massachusetts 7, includes most of Cambridge, Boston, Somerville, Randolph, Everett, Milton, and Chelsea. I know we have folks from around the country, um, but for those that are, that are local, I want to make sure they know what is the Massachusetts 7. Um, but it's been among the hardest hit areas throughout the entire Commonwealth. Now, despite accounting for just 25 and 20% of this, despite accounting for just 20% uh, of the city's population, Black and Latinx residents make up approximately 65% of COVID-19 infections. Staggering. And these numbers are even far worse for our neighbors behind the wall. People who are incarcerated have been made incredibly vulnerable throughout this crisis. Prisons and jails are petri dishes for COVID-19 spread. We knew they would be. Although CDC guidelines encourage physical distancing, sanitary practices, and access to medical professional, to medical professionals, corrections and detention facilities are largely overcrowded because of mass incarceration and unsanitary and limited in health care. So despite this common understanding, many in government were choosing to implement facility lockdowns instead of to take the necessary steps to decarcerate leading to further isolation and preventable deaths. I heard from constituents who were not permitted to visit their loved ones or to hear their voice over the phone or to receive a letter for months while news outlets were reporting spikes in COVID in our uh, state counties and jails and our prisons throughout the country. So this is why I teamed up with Senator Warren on another piece of legislation to get data specifically from prisons and jails the COVID-19 in Corrections Data Transparency Act would require federal, state, and local entities to provide disaggregated and anonymized data on COVID spread behind the wall. I also have a bill with Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib that was introduced to allow for people to be released to home confinement. Again, pursuing alternatives, pushing for medical parolees, for the decarceration of um, our elderly population, um, those that are pregnant. So it's important to note that I'm not advocating for robust data collection for its own sake. This is not data mining for data mining. I believe that that which gets measured gets done. Because we have a more accurate depiction of who is experiencing the greatest harm during this pandemic, Congress and elected leaders across the country are able to marshal resources to those communities. I certainly believe our shining that spotlight on what was happening to our incarcerated neighbors is why so many uh, governors, including in Massachusetts, did prioritize them in phase one um, of vaccine distribution. I don't think that that would have happened. So in the American Rescue Plan, over $7 billion were appropriated to community health centers that predominantly serve low-income patients of color. We also secured billions of dollars for racial equity initiatives to support education campaigns and to build trust with communities of color. In addition, we included provisions to increase vaccine access for black and Latinx folks. I wanted to do everything I could to guide against uh, what seemed an emerging pattern of vaccine redlining. So while some have been fixated with mass vaccination sites at stadiums that are far away and hard to get to, um, in order to guard against vaccine redlining, I, I was advocating for a more community-based race conscious approach, one that meets people in community where they are, that brings vaccines directly to those who need it the most. 
This is also about meeting the needs of our seniors. This is also a matter of disability justice. These actions were only possible because of the data we collected. Again, that which gets measured gets done. So detailed data collection is the necessary work of anti-racism in public health. We can't eradicate systemic racism in healthcare unless we are first willing to do our research, but we shouldn't stop there. We need to translate that data into policy, bold progressive policy. Structural racism in the United States spans centuries and it is codified in our nation's founding documents. So taking incremental steps and putting forth half measures is not merely insufficient. It is counterproductive to our goal of achieving health equity. It's long past time that we finally create a healthcare system founded on health equity, one where there is quality care for every person. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of Medicare for All. It's more than just a slogan. It's a vision of an America that understands that our greatest wealth is the health of our people, of all our people. The greed of corporate executives should not outweigh respect for human dignity and basic need. And the cowardice of some elected officials will not compromise the boldness of our proposal. Ida B. Wells understood this. In the face of white mob violence, she was unapologetic in her advocacy for change. She published research, wrote articles, delivered speeches, and outlined reforms to end white terror and the lynching crisis. Wells envisioned a federal government that was responsive to the black community and actively protected them. Decades ago, she was telling Congress that the president and Black Lives Matter and calling the federal government to investigate lynchings and to hold perpetrators accountable. Many, including those who agreed with her message, called her efforts outlandish, radical, and even dangerous. Nearly a century later, we must show that same courage to speak truth to power, to be bold in our advocacy. And there's no better way to do that than putting pen to paper and writing equity and justice directly into our laws. Policy is my love language and the Anti-Racism and Public Health Act is one of my bills introduced in partnership with Representative Barbara Lee and Senator Warren to bring about healthcare justice. Our legislation would expand federal research and investment into the public health impacts of structural racism and require the federal government to finally proactively develop anti-racist health policy and to take a public health approach to combating police violence, which currently is the sixth leading cause of death for black men. Yes, violence at the hands of public, violence at the hands of law enforcement, it is a public health issue. Look at the lives, so many lives that we've been robbed of. Too many to name, but I'll bring some into the space. Terrence Coleman, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Ayanna Stanley. With studies, again, concluding that police brutality is the sixth leading cause of death for young black men, it is time that we treat police violence like the public health emergency that it is. As many of you know, the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd has dominated recent news coverage, rightfully so. There is a direct link to the lynchings of the late 19th century and the lynchings we too often see on our news feeds today. This is a crisis. And Ida B. Wells sounded the alarm so many years ago. Her work is unfinished and we must take up the mantle and continue the fight with this legislation. The Anti-Racism and Public Health Act would create a national center for anti-racism at the CDC and a law enforcement violence prevention program. This bill puts a premium on data collection and again is rooted in community. But make no mistake, we already have sufficient data spanning centuries of research to, to declare structural racism in the public health crisis that it is. And we, and we have got to pass this bill. I want to applaud Boston University School of Public Health Act and Center for Anti-Racist Research for your commitment to addressing anti-racism in public health. I'm so grateful to participate in today's convening. In closing, I'll leave you all with a quote from Ida B. Wells. Whenever you are questioning the importance of data collection or the impact of research or how justice can result from data, remember her words. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Presley, for your powerful and insightful, um, you know, and inspiring, um, you know, talk and, and for connecting your courage in many ways to Ida B. Wells' courage to, to, to lead the way in, in collecting data and, and, and revealing a problem that, of course, policy can, can tackle. So I just wanted to sort of express my thanks to you for joining us. Uh, today, um, and you know, thank you as always for your struggle. In solidarity, always. Definitely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you for joining us. Well, I um, I want to again thank Congresswoman Presley and uh, her team for uh, being with us today. I saw a lot of comments in the chat about uh, policy is my love language for a bumper sticker, which uh, seems to capture uh, Congresswoman's. Uh, um, uh, amazing remarks really well, thank you. We're now going to move on to the next part of uh, this afternoon and uh, it's my great privilege of introducing today's moderator, uh, Dr. Laura Magania. Dr. Magania is president and CEO of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. It's been a real joy and a privilege to know Dr. Magania over many years as a good colleague and friend, Dr. Magania. Thanks, Ingalia, and thank you all for joining us today for day two of this three-part series. So I have the honor of introducing our panelists uh, for today's conversation. But before I do, let me remind you to send your questions to the Q&A box, and we will get to them as soon as the presentations are uh, finished. First, we will hear from Ms. Samantha Artiga. Ms. Artiga serves as Vice President and Director of the Racial Equity and Health Policy Program at the Kaiser Family Foundation. In this role, Ms. Artiga leads the foundation's work to provide timely and reliable data information and policy analysis on health and healthcare disparities affecting people of color and underserved groups and efforts to advance racial equity in health and healthcare. Next, we will turn to Professor Patricia Williams. Professor Williams holds a joint appointment between the Northeastern School of Law and the Department of Philosophy and Religion in the College of Social Science and Humanities. She's one of the most provocative intellectuals in American law and a pioneer of both the law and literature and critical race theory movements in American legal theory. And she has published widely in the areas of race, gender, literature, and law. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Eliseo perez Estad, director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. perez Estad practiced general internal medicine for 37 years at the University of California, San Francisco before moving to NIH in September 2015. His research interests include improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research workforce. Welcome all. Ms. Artiga, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really honored and humbled to be included in this conversation today with such tremendous leaders and to have this uh, conversation kicked off with those really inspiring words and the call to action from Congresswoman Presley. Uh, what I've been asked to do today is to provide some insight into how our work at KSF or the Kaiser Family Foundation has shifted during the pandemic and how we have really attempted to provide data and research to drive for greater equity in COVID-19 response. So I have a few slides that I'm gonna share and let me just get those going. Um, and chat, just if you can see those, okay, that'd be great. Um, before I get started, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on who we are as an organization for those of you who may not be familiar with us. KSF, or the Kaiser Family Foundation, is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is dedicated to providing information and research to help inform on health issues that are affecting the nation. We're not affiliated with Kaiser Permanente in any way. That's sometimes a point of a confusion given our name, so I did want to clarify that. Um, our organization conducts work across a range of areas, including policy analysis, polling and survey research, journalism through our Kaiser Health News Service, and also through public health information campaigns. And today you're gonna to get to see examples um, from work across many of these areas. 
And we really strive to reach a diverse audience that includes policymakers, journalists, the health policy community, and the public. As was mentioned at KFF, I direct our policy analysis work within our racial equity and health policy program area. And I wanna stress that we have been conducting research and policy analysis focused on health and healthcare disparities since long before the pandemic began. Uh, this work has really focused on providing timely and reliable data and information to help inform and advance efforts uh, to achieve greater health equity. We do this by providing information and education to help increase understanding and awareness of disparities, we conducted data analysis to provide insight into the status of disparities and how they are changing over time. And we analyzed the implications of emerging policy proposals or changes on disparities and efforts to advance equity. Now, when the COVID-19 pandemic began, work across all areas of our foundation shifted to focus on COVID-19 and in particular on the disparate impacts of the pandemic for people of color and underserved groups that were due to the long-standing underlying structural and systemic inequities that were already in place. At the outset of the pandemic, a lot of this work focused on providing insight into how the underlying inequities that were already in place put some groups, including people of color, at increased risk for COVID-19. You can see some examples of the types of analysis we conducted to document how these risks um, were increased for some groups. And all of these analyses are available through our website at kff.org. I encourage you uh, to take a look through them and do a deep dive on all the data that is available there. This initial work really built on our existing research and analysis that documented disparities in health and healthcare. And together, the body of work really showed how people of color and low-income populations were placed at greater risk for exposure to COVID-19 due to their living, work, and transportation situations, how underlying disparities in health placed them at risk for increased, at increased risk for experiencing illness and death if they contracted the virus, and how underlying disparities in access to healthcare left them facing more barriers to accessing testing and treatment related to COVID-19. As the pandemic progressed, much of our work then shifted to documenting the unequal impacts of COVID-19. That is really showing how those increased risks resulted in people of color experiencing higher rates of infection, illness, and death due to COVID-19. As you heard from Congresswoman Presley, this work was extremely challenging at first because there were major gaps in the data available to understand the impacts of the virus by race and ethnicity. At the outset, we did not have federally reported data and very few states were reporting these data. These data gaps began to fill in as more states began reporting data and the federal government began reporting data but there remain significant gaps and limitations in the data that make it challenging to get a complete picture and really understand how different individuals and groups have been affected by the virus. Um, at KSF, we really attempted to help fill in some of these gaps by collecting and analyzing the data that were report, being reported by states to document how people of color were experiencing disproportionate shares of cases and deaths. Other organizations, including the COVID Tracking Project, also really stepped in to help fill these data gaps as well. In part, through our survey work, we also strove to really document how people of color experienced other disproportionate impacts of the pandemic beyond just infection, illness, and death. These included negative economic impacts, such as greater job loss and income loss, greater negative impacts on mental health, as well as more negative impacts and other factors that are key drivers of health, such as food security and housing instability. Now with the vaccination rollout uh, underway, much of our work has been focused on, in, on working toward advanced equity in COVID-19 vaccination efforts. As you heard from Congresswoman Presley, I think even before the vaccinations became available, Many of us were concerned that the same structural inequities that contributed to the disproportionate impacts of the virus 
would also contribute to disparities in vaccination efforts. What we've seen as the vaccines have become available is that there is more data that is readily available from states that tracks who is getting vaccinated uh, by race and ethnicity compared to what we saw early on with cases and deaths. But there are still gaps and limitations. And at the federal level, we do not have this demographic data being reported at, uh, by state jurisdiction. That means we are still out there collecting data from the states to really get a picture of what vaccination patterns look like at the state level by race and ethnicity. And what those data have shown is that there is a very consistent pattern of Black and Hispanic people receiving smaller shares of vaccinations compared to their shares of cases and deaths and the total population across states. And what that translates into is lower vaccination rates for Black and Hispanic people compared to their white counterparts. Aside from documenting those disparities, we also have been collecting and summarizing strategies that are being employed at the state level um, and at the federal level to try and address some of those disparities. You heard some of those efforts touched upon uh, by Congresswoman Presley, in particular, the role of community health centers. We've also done analysis of the data of who has been vaccinated through community health centers, which really shows that they're a particularly effective avenue for reaching people of color, reflecting their longstanding role serving these populations. Aside from this data collection and analysis, our polling and survey team launched our vaccine monitor survey, which is an ongoing survey that provides timely insight into people's attitudes and experiences with COVID-19 vaccines and the ongoing pandemic. And reflecting our survey research and other data showing that people have questions and concerns about the vaccine and that many want information from healthcare providers to address those concerns, our social impact media team launched an incredible national campaign in partnership with the Black Coalition Against COVID and Dr. Rhea Boyd called The Conversation Between Us About Us which is really designed to provide credible and accessible information to Black communities through Black healthcare workers so that they have the information that they need to make an informed choice about getting the vaccine. We're also currently in a development with, for a similar campaign to address information needs among the Latino community and Spanish speaking communities. So hopefully this description of the work provides more insight into how we have responded to the pandemic and really highlighted how important data is as part of efforts to advance equity. I really view comprehensive high quality data as central to our efforts to advance equity. We need the data to understand who is being impacted by the pandemic and how. The data can then be used to guide resources and efforts to mitigate COVID-19 risks and impacts. We can uh, use data and in, to get more insight into best practices or strategies to address disparities. And the data are key for measuring progress toward equity over time. And despite some improvements we've seen in data collection over the course of the pandemic, there are significant gaps and limitations in the data that persist. The data, data are in, incomplete and insufficient particularly for smaller groups and subpopulations. We continue to lack standardized data across states that make it difficult to make comparisons across states in terms of how states are doing with the vaccination efforts. And all of these together really point to the importance of continuing to prioritize data, addressing data gaps, so that we can use data to shape actions and, po and policies for continued work to advance equity. And I just want to leave you with a few final takeaways uh, based on, on the work that we've conducted over the past year in response to COVID-19. As you heard Congresswoman Presley say, and I think we all recognize, is that health and healthcare disparities have been a long-standing and persistent challenge that reflect a broad range of underlying social and economic inequities. They are not new as a result of COVID-19. Yet COVID-19 has contributed to a newly increased awareness of and attention to disparities. 
And addressing the disparate impact of COVID-19 going, is going to be key for preventing even further widening of health disparities going forward. Given where we are today, with the, the heavily disproportionate impacts of the pandemic, combined with the increased awareness and a focus on these disparities, we really are in a pivotal moment for action to advance equity. And some of those actions that we might consider are really how we can prioritize equity across sectors and address those underlying structures and structures and systems that drive inequities, how we not only prioritize equity, but also direct resources to support work to advance equity and support those community resources that are so key for that work, that we continue to work for more comprehensive and consistent data collection and reporting, and that we use those data to measure against and work toward more equity going forward. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be part of the conversation, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Ms. Artiga, for really the emphasizing the importance of data and data analysis to really advance in equity. Thank you. Uh, to you, Professor Williams. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure and an honor um, to be on this panel. Um, I, I want to say that the reason I grew up in Massachusetts um, is because my mother's family several generations back was from Memphis. My grandmother went to Rust University a few years after Ida B. Wells. And it was at Ida Wells, because of Ida Wells data about what was happening in that region, um, that she and her sisters came to Massachusetts. And I grew up with in what would have been Ayanna Presley's district, if only um, we had had Ayanna and Ayanna Presley um, in those days. Um, so again, it's such a lovely and ironic honor to be here. Um, I uh, also wanna focus on data and the interpretation of data, um, because it seems to me that when we talk about uh, the fact that African-Americans or Latinas are dying at twice the rate um, of others from COVID, um, one of the risks that I encounter in discussions uh, with people about these data um, is that it's just in their biology. That the data then gets taken, essentialized and flattened. Um, and furthermore, um, I wanna talk about the intersection of that with algorithmic misinterpretations of the data. And let me give you an example. Um, I am a woman of a certain age and doctors routinely use two metrics to understand what your risk of osteoporosis is, age and sex. So I am a woman of a certain age. And those two points are triggers for testing women over the age of 60 for osteopenia and osteoporosis. And thus, recently I was given a routine bone scan and the results came back to a computer on my doc doctor's desk and they were supposed to figure out whether or not I might need medication, what the results, whether I was, you know, what, what my bones were doing, using my individual data and predictive algorithms. And the doctor sat behind his computer screen for a very long time. And finally, his head emerged from around the rim of the screen. And he cleared his throat and he mumbled that the machine couldn't seem to do the calculation. And then he said, it's probably because you're black. Now, and maybe it's because I work in this area, but I was completely undaunted, very annoyed, but undaunted. And I told him just to sabotage that my machine, that machine by pulling a reverse Rachel Dolezal and telling that machine that I was white. Um, and based on that simple switch of identity, the system promptly presented me with a slew of additional questions, like whether I'd ever broken a bone, if so, at what age, whether I showed signs of rheumatoid arthritis, and most urgently, whether there was osteoporosis in my family, especially my mother. Now, the fact that the machine would not have asked me any of that if I had been categorized as black was machine bias of a profound and profoundly troubling sort. Indeed, although the machine apparently had categorized my blackness as self-identified, no one had actually asked me about my heritage. Clearly some administrator or nurse had checked the box based on how purportedly and persistently self-evident or obvious race is thought to be within the American cultural context. And so the infinite spectrum of melanin inheritance is thus 
and particularly the infinite spectrum within those of us who are identified as American African Americans, is reductively seen as an either or. You're either black or you're white. And in addition, the authority of my very well-trained doctor, a human expert, was superseded by the narrow closed loop small-mindedness of a black box containing only the pathways programmed by a non-medical computer scientist who was apparently socialized to think about race as binary and blinding. And the deference my doctor accorded to the machine and the deference most of us accord to algorithms dissociates and dislocates particularized human experience in this fashion. And so black box medicine may be great at identifying and assessing broad patterns, but when it comes to the peculiarly uh, you know, the complex intricacies of individual bodies as a nation of extraordinarily mixed and diasporic heritage, that deference to the machine can effectively end up treating probabilities as though they were certainties or absolutes in or out, all or nothing. And thus, varying organic presentations of disease, as well as adaptations to varying ecologically condi ecological conditions, like how close we are living in a pandemic, um, or famine, altitude, epigenetic concerns, are best thought of as precisely that, variations. Now, given this, attention to fate of people, color, people of color in a pandemic, I think is both overdue and double-edged. It highlights the inequities in which we live, but it also risks in the fashion that that black box, uh, box did of reinforcing them as innate. And this is a problem of interpretation of even the finest data. So for example, if the United States' rates of infection were at one point wildly off the charts compared to other nations, we don't generally blame it on the innate conditions of a peculiarly American biology. <laughs> we know that these numbers are the product of policies, specific policy decisions. We know that we know that and just so disproportionate deaths among communities of color should not be attributed to an imagined separateness of African American biology. We should understand that too as the product of poor policy. But the risk I think is that we exist against a backdrop of the kind of magical thinking that undoes empirical evidence over and over and over again in the name of racial difference. Biology must be the reason that blacks and Latinos have more COVID, Bi biology must be um, the reason. And in fact, when I was preparing for this, um, I was looking at, you know, what are the rates for black men, black women, Latinos, Native Americans and so forth. And I came across an article whose title was something like, Do Black Women Matter in COVID Assessments? And I, since I happen to be a Black woman, I wanted to know the answer to that question. And in fact, I lost it in my browser. I couldn't find it again. And so I kept looking and looking and looking for that article. And in my, in, in my search for its recuperation, I turned to Google. And I still didn't find it. But instead, what I found was a boatload of articles that popped up that instead led me to conclude that if black women do matter, it's not quite in the way that I would hope. I began to see the profile of my black woman's body through the eyes of others. And again, a random online communities is not the way any of us want to see ourselves. But I was struck. The Google search referred me to questions addressing why it is that black women's breasts produce chocolate colored milk and why it is that black women's hair feels like steel when you touch it, and why black women don't seem to like it when you touch their hair, and why is it that black women have high blood pressure, and how is it that black women don't get breast cancer or skin cancer, or how come black women have more testosterone than white women, and isn't testosterone how come black women are just so strong, by the way, and why I just don't understand why black women don't like you touching their hair. I really just don't understand. And it goes on and on about longer penises, thicker skin, don't feel pain. And it seems to me this is how this non-academic, non-scientific nonsense drowns out the science. It makes, a, it makes the, the normative consequences of slavery, even the, as profoundly unscientific as they are, a huge filter of 
of utter nonsense through which the data has to be understood and through which we also have to measure our very best algorithmic interpretations um, to, as filters as well. Because we are dealing with an interpretive problem that rests again on magical thinking and a kind of magical thinking that hurts us all. When you put us all in the COVID bath of proximity, essential jobs that provide no PPE, we all die at the same rates. And when we begin to recognize that commonality of our human susceptibility, then we will be able to assess a notion of equity uh, that is truly in the realm of the public good. Thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, Professor Williams, yes. thank you for bringing it to the table for our discussion with the issue of interpretation of the data. Very, very important, thank you. So now we have uh, Dr. Eliseo Perez Estrada. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Sandro, for inviting me to be on this distinguished uh, panel and to have the opportunity to speak to uh, an audience that most of the time we, we don't, uh, I don't uh, get to, uh, to address. So I'm gonna share my screen for a moment uh, in order to, uh, to show the slides that I have uh, prepared. And just give me a second and try to keep it to the 10 minutes that we have. I'm at the National Institutes of Health, the primary research agency uh, in science for the United States and arguably for the world. And I direct the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparity. So as you can imagine, um, this is a topic that I have been um, managing, dealing with, and trying to address uh, nonstop pretty much for the past year. Um, I will wanna make one clarifying statement is that data on uh, race, ethnicity, and other factors from uh, the CDC are actually collected by local and state health departments, not by any federal agency. Um, and they are fed back to the CDC for, um, uh, for uh, storage and for publishing, um, but they are not uh, collected by federal agents. Um, there were enormous challenges in uh, collecting uh, accurate data on race ethnicity from the beginning and still to this day, frequently uh, it's non-response. Um, we um, uh, see the issue of health outcomes uh, from our research lens uh, using four populations with health disparities are listed in the top four bullets. The first three were uh, legislated in our founding in the year 2000. And in 2016, we added the population of sexual and gender minorities uh, for NIH research purposes. And when we, a health outcome is worse in one of these groups, uh, usually in comparison to a reference group, uh, that is what we define as a health disparity. We also embrace the concept that every one of these four populations uh, share a social disadvantage that results in part from having been subject to discrimination or racism and having been underserved in healthcare. Um, so race ethnicity is a self-identified social construct and there is no discussion uh, on my end from that regards. I know that there are many um, biologically oriented scientists who would dispute this, uh, but the consensus in the field is that this is, it is something that is self-identified and social construct. And in fact, if it was up to me, I would ask, how do you identify yourself and offer categories as the census tried to do for 2020, but was not allowed. Um, the, uh, the construct has behavioral, biological and environmental components. And these are components that are really useful to look at as a tool for discovery science at all levels, whether it be whether a gene or epigenetic changes occur, why behaviors are different, or how the environment affects different population groups. Um, and this is something that we do all the time. The legacy of racism and discrimination, as well as individual experiences, do travel with this self-identified construct. At least that is what we believe. Um, and therefore that's what gives it more importance 
than things like ancestral genetic markers, which uh, are, again, are a tool. I want to also emphasize how important socioeconomic status is as a second pillar. I call these our two pillars at NIMHD, at our institute. And this is a simple answer um, from a few years ago, looking at national data and mortality. So if you're poor, $25,000 is approximately the household uh, income uh, that defines a poverty level for a family of four. You're three times more likely to die from something uh, than if your household income for a family of four is $115,000. Um, now, we know $115,000 is okay, but it's certainly not wealthy. And you can see this gradient is as robust as, let's say, tobacco smoking or blood pressure in leading to mortality. And how often do we not pay attention to that, um, both in clinical uh, care, science, and in society? So race and socioeconomic status are really fundamental in determining health. They predict so much that we actually need to measure it and we need to measure it accurately. Uh, not only life expectancy, but also differences that have been noted in well done uh, observational studies where African-Americans uh, have twice as many strokes for the same level of systolic blood pressure when compared to white counterparts. And these are uh, individuals, adults, age 45 to 64. Uh, poor people in general smoke more, drink more, have higher uh, body mass index, and have higher rates of most chronic diseases. Um, uh, and then among persons with diabetes is another example. Um, all racial and ethnic minority groups have actually less heart disease, fewer heart attacks, but more kidney disease or end-stage renal disease compared to whites with diabetes. Why is that? And this is where the question of measuring accurately or measuring systematically in a standardized way becomes more important. The role of racism here is uh, one that I think all of us at NIH have uh, begun to uh, accept, not only uh, realize how important it is, uh, but how important it is to address it and, stud and study it and reduce it. These are data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, you heard from them earlier, uh, from 2015. Uh, and asking the question about in the past 30 days, were you treated unfairly because of racial or ethnic background in store, work, entertainment, place, uh, dealing with police or getting health care? And you can see the responses. 53% of African-American respondents and 36% of Latino respondents said yes. Mind you, this is the past 30 days, not lifetime. So the, the reality is that racism exists. It is prevalent. And we need to acknowledge it, acknowledge the history as has been, has been mentioned earlier, uh, but also see how we can address it and reduce it. And we start by acknowledging it. Now, <clears throat> I am uh, no longer active in, uh, in caring for patients, but I value the enormous importance that a trusted clinician can have, particularly in individuals with chronic disease. And these are summary of some data that I think are relevant. Um, first of all, patient-clinician communication, effective one, it can not only improve patient satisfaction, improve taking medications uh, or adhering to uh, behavioral change, lead to better health outcomes, and less malpractice events. These have all been studied in well-done, rigorous studies. Uh, about a third, up to a third of all patients, uh, when asked, have trouble understanding their doctor. They say their doctor did not listen to them or had questions they could not ask. Uh, when uh, scientists have done very elegant studies looking at race concordance or language concordance um, in, in the case of uh, non-English speaking Latinos, um, these metrics have improved considerably and actually are more important than health literacy uh, of the patient. In the year 2020, only 13% of medical school graduates were from African-American or Latino backgrounds, 13%. Now, I think last count, the population was 33% of those two groups and 40% of children are from those two groups. There's a huge gap here. Um, in 2014, it was 10%. So that's an improvement of barely 3% in six years. This is a direct intervention that works Minority physicians care for more than 50% of poor uh, and uninsured people, 
and a majority of those with limited English proficiency and immigrants and patients on Medi-Cal. Uh, so uh, believe me, or Medicaid, I'm sorry, California roots showing. Um, but in reality, when, when you think about it, this is an intervention that works yet. We cannot change this policy. Why don't we train more um, uh, diverse clinicians? Now, COVID-19, of course, has shown a bright light on these disparities. Um, we published a commentary almost a year ago now uh, when the first data were emerging. Um, over 50% of cases, as you've heard, 45% of mortality uh, occurring in Latinos, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and African Americans, and other Pacific, and Pacific Islanders as well, uh, even though we represent about a third of the population. And this, this proportionate burden has not really changed after 15 months. Um, the important point has already been made, just to re reiterate it, the underlying cause of this burden is related to the longstanding disparities and disadvantage. It's higher proportion of public facing jobs, not having the privilege of sheltering at home and working from home and tele teleworking uh, for most of most days, like I do, um, living in cities that are more crowded housing, uh, apartment building with 10, 10 uh, floors, uh, as, as it happens in the District of Columbia, is not the same as a suburb with single family homes and yards where you have more easily physical distancing. And then crowded within housing, uh, many uh, families are two or three generations within a single household. Many are sharing two families, sharing one household, uh, one bathroom. How, how do you shelter in place? How do you self-isolate under those conditions? Well, you know the answer. Um, there is a higher rate of comorbid conditions, particularly diabetes, I would point out, uh, and particularly uh, cardiovascular disease uh, that does result in more likelihood of severe disease and death. Um, and there's also lack of access to care uh, and people avoiding health care for a variety of reasons uh, that, uh, that meant that these individuals, these patients would present in more advanced uh, conditions uh, to uh, get health care and therefore be harder uh, to, um, uh, to save. So uh, it is imperative and NIH has embraced this imperative need to implement evaluate and, and disseminate strategies to address these unequal uh, images. Now, um, research on structural racism um, is one of our priorities right now. We published a funding opportunity announcement that means a, a call for scientists to study this. Um, this is the history and culture and institutions policies have codified these practices by perpetuating these inequities um, and promoting uh, an ideology of inferiority. It isn't just, you know, racism and discrimination are based not just on phenotypical characteristics and discrimination against dark uh, blacks and brown people, but it's also an issue of power um, because the other side has the power. And this organized system that categorizes ranks, devalues and disempowers and differentially allocates resources. This is a critical underpinning of structural racism. Um, uh, the residential segregation policy that was deployed and implemented in the United States in the late 1930s and 1940s is really the cornerstone of this system. You could say we can go back to 1619 or 1865, et cetera, but let's look at the modern time because that allowed white uh, families to generate wealth, to generate equity as their properties uh, increased in value, educational, uh, educational quality decreased, um, uh, economic opportunities decrease, et cetera. So we need to study this and, uh, and intervene to reduce these. And we, I list three areas that this could happen. Organizational level climate and hiring, promotion, disciplinary practices. And I'm referring to our own academic institutions, including the NIH as a research and science-based institution, but also our educational institutions from preschool all the way to college. Policies in, in housing and lending, Zoning, transportation, green space, and food markets, access to healthy food um, is marginalized. And finally, the criminal justice practices, land and water rights issues, immigration, voting rights, and then how uh, different populations are portrayed in the media, which is a whole topic in and of itself. Um, I think this may be my last slide. Yes, thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to 
um, uh, the conversation, time for conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perez Estable, for this great uh, presentation. And I will invite all the panelists to be uh, with the video on at this time to start our conversation. We have uh, a lot of questions, and I would like just to start, first of all, thanking all of you for great, thoughtful uh, remarks. And I would like to open this conversation with a couple of like more general questions, although the first one is more uh, towards, I, I guess, Dr. Perez Estable. But my first question will be, uh, NIH has created the National Institute of Minority Health and health disparities. And several of our public health schools have created anti-racism research center. But we want all 26 of the NIH centers and all of our institutions and every department of, at our schools to really focus on being able uh, to advance health equity and being agents of change by promoting anti-racist policies, policies, practices, and research. So how do we bring that to the field while not making it a silo, but rather a responsibility of, of all of us. So I got it, that was for me. Uh, <clears throat> so the Congress created the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, not the NIH. And, and there was a congressional movement in the late 1990s uh, that led to our founding. We became an institute as part of the uh, Affordable Care Act in the 2010. Prior to that, we were a center. Um, that means we have direct appropriations from Congress and we generate our scientific program. We decide on funding scientists for doing research. And, and we collaborate. I collaborate with my colleagues who are a terrific group of, uh, of scientists. Um, NIH has done, uh, well, and, and we are charged actually not just with that, uh, that, that mission, but also to monitor and encourage use of uh, minority health, health disparities research across the entire agency. So in that spirit, we created a strategic plan for NIH as a whole. Uh, that we led. Uh, it was just uh, officially publicly published after many months of clearance and preparation. Um, and we also, I could say that Dr. Francis Collins has embraced this idea that you propose in the question uh, and created a process called UNITE um, that is looking both internally, uh, communication-wise, externally for our grantees and on our research agenda, so how we can address issues particularly around structural racism. Uh, mm -hmm. So I do think that, um, that uh, we, we, we are at least uh, uh, emphasizing this. And I, as a director of the NIMHD, am very pleased with the direction that it's going. Let's see what happens. Thank you so much. So I, the following, if there's not directed to any particular, please feel free to, to, to answer. We have one question that says that data tell a story of racism regardless what you look at, COVID, low birth weight, median household income. How can policy address this? Is it by prioritizing services to those who suffer the impact of racism, like AAPL Latinos? And if so, does that mean leaving white people behind? Who wants to answer that one? I can start and then if others wanna jump in, I think what we're seeing is the recognition that if we want to address these inequities that we have to work farther upstream to address the real systemic and structural drivers of inequity. Um, and when we are considering health disparities in particular, we need to look outside the healthcare sector to the other factors that we know are so pivotal in driving health beyond just healthcare. So that means things like access to food, uh, easy access to healthy food options through grocery stores in the neighborhood, sufficient uh, income to purchase enough food for your family, the stability and safety of housing, the educational and employment opportunities that are available to people. And so I think if we want to make real change, it's going to be necessary to do the hard work of addressing these big structural issues that are the root causes of the inequities that we then see in health and healthcare. And that's gonna require focused long-term efforts, working cross sector. And as I mentioned in my comments, not only prioritizing equity, then, but then putting the resources and leadership behind it to support that prioritization. 
And may I just jump in and, and, yes, and, yes. and, and add that uh, one of the problems is that as to each of these different layers of social address that, that uh, Samantha just suggested, one frequently hears the same question, will that leave white people behind? And so I think that we really, really need to think about the zero sum game implied in framing the question that way. Um, this question of distributive justice for us as Americans is a difficult one. If every time we have a problem, it's going to be, am I going to be left behind? And if we have, we're all on the deck of the Titanic, give me the lifeboat first. Um, or if you get on a lifeboat, there won't be, there won't be room for me. Um, I, I think that, that confounds our best efforts over and over and over again. I would just highlight the importance here of social class. And, and no, there are many, many poor whites in America that would benefit from these programs. Um, and I value what Samantha has said about we, we as health uh, policy and uh, health scientists need to involve other sectors of society if we're gonna move the needle on the structural problems that we, that we face that are underlying cause of many of these disparities that we have been observing and describing for you know, the last 30 to 40 years. Absolutely. Taking another question uh, about the grassroots. So are there any suggestions on how local grassroots efforts can more successfully support the increase in local funding or resources for looking into and addressing disparities? There are two lines of interventions that, you know, I don't know the answer to the question, but I'll just venture to a couple of suggestions that I've heard and thought of myself as scientists uh, thinking. One has been mentioned earlier about strengthening the community health centers and the frontline uh, healthcare. We have a healthcare system that is turned upside down. We, we, I think Dr. Galea has used the analogy of the great soccer team that has a wonderful goalie, but not very good uh, at the rest of the team. And that's what happens out there. We have a great goalie. We have a great uh, tertiary quaternary healthcare system, but not primary healthcare. And we need it in the community. Um, and the other is to, uh, we know what to do in terms of lifestyle interventions and healthy communities. And we know, well, at least we have some evidence to know what to do, but we need to have the will to implement it and create healthy communities where we have access to healthy food, economic opportunity, um, green space, uh, quality education. And, and you know, this is not easy and it's not short-term, so. Thank you, thank you. So we have a very specific question here that why aren't Asians included in the data? Not included Asians perpetuates the inequities Asian face and allows for the continued underfunding a little attention around policy grants, et cetera, to them. Uh, I, I can take this one. Uh, and Samantha, you may have, uh, Asian Americans are very heterogeneous and they always, they're, my, my uh, stakeholders always say, well, we got to disaggregate, it's not the same. And, and they're right, South Asians are very different from East Asians. So Chinese and Indians are very different in any way you cut it, historically, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, Pacific Islanders are actually considered a separate race and have a health profile that is uh, similar to American Indians. So they're actually worse off than African-Americans for many of the of the health issues that we have, but they're small populations. So we don't have as good a handle on national estimates uh, there. And in the profession, uh, Asians are not underrepresented. That's, there's no question about that data. That's true in, in science and it's true in medicine, in, in health care. Um, uh, the, the lack of Asians in leadership roles is where we see the deficiency. So similar, perhaps in some ways in medicine, we see with women have you know, when I went to medical school, there were, uh, you know, 4% of my class were women. Uh, today, it's over 50%. Um, but women are still far from being representative at the associate professor or full professor or leadership roles in, in, uh, in, med in academic medicine, for example. So. Mm -hmm. but can, I, can I just add, I think that even as to Asians, uh, writ large across the board, including Pacific Islanders, but Asians who come from both South Asia, Chinese, Japanese, and so forth, everybody is dying at faster rates than white population, according, even though the data sets are smaller in the United States. Asians die at greater rates. Whites still, as I recall, 
um, survive, have the greatest survivability rates, despite, um, yeah. I think the initial question uh, was also in part why, why is the Asian data omitted from a lot of the reporting? Um, and I think I pointed out that there are longstanding and continuing gaps and problems with the data. And one of these is that we many times have insufficient data to be able to report for smaller population groups, including Asian populations, including American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander groups. And we also often don't have sufficient data to be able to break out those data into the smaller subpopulations, which as was just mentioned is really key because it is such a heterogeneous pop population. And that if you group everyone together, you're often masking large disparities that exist. Um, and so it's an ongoing challenge that we continue to have insufficient data for these groups, particularly in the federal survey data sets which really points to the need for funding and resources to really oversample those groups so that mm -hmm. we can have more data to understand those experiences. And then um, at the state and local level, there's a lot of variation across states in terms of how they uh, group people, their racial ethnic classifications, um, and that continues to make it extremely challenging to understand um, how different people are being affected. Oh, absolutely, I agree. So I think that moving forward, this is really uh, an area that we should improve and just advocate for including in the data. So there's another uh, question here. Have you noted any progress among states addressing some of the COVID-19 disparities by race since the pandemic started? What can state and county, or, yeah, and, and, and county DOH do better? Um, I can start on this one. I, I think as you saw in the presentations, the patterns we've seen in um, illness and, and death have, re have remained um, with disparities over the course of the pandemic. We've seen some of those gaps uh, shrink over time, but I think that really just reflects the continued spread of the infection um, into the white population over the course of the pandemic. But we continue to see those racial gaps with people of color experiencing higher rates of illness and death. We also know that um, people of color are dying younger also compared to their white counterparts. So um, those disparities have persisted. In terms of what we are seeing with the vaccination efforts, again, it is the same pattern. And although I know there have been very concerted efforts to try and improve equity in vaccinations, the data are showing a consistent trend of that gap persisting and in some areas actually widening. Um, that really speak to the continued focus on trying to move toward greater equity and really addressing access barriers to vaccination. I think in the media, there has been um, a lot of attention on people's willingness to get the vaccine and um, that that is a bit misplaced because um, it doesn't matter if someone's willing to get it if they can't access it if they want it. And I think what we've seen a lot of early on are access barriers to vaccination that disproportionately affect people of color and low-income populations. But because the disparities have an underlying cause of structural inequity, they're not going to go away uh, because you know, uh, you know, uh, office workers are not going to suddenly go work at the grocery store uh, or in construction. So, and then the other challenge has been that people are really tired, uh, they're numb, uh, and 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 people are not not trying hard to keep to you know mask wearing, physical distancing, washing your hands. If we were able to have done that from the beginning, I, you know, the mortality rate overall would have probably been reduced by about fifty percent. I think that's a a, a reasonable uh, estimate. But don't underestimate the enormous achievement so far, and we need to keep pushing, of having immunized or vaccinated over 100 million Americans. Uh, I mean, this is huge. Um, we've never tried to do this before. And yes, there have been a ton of hiccups. There's inequity. Uh, but if we keep at it, we will get everyone who wants a vaccine immunized by the summer. And I, I'm confident that we can do that. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the private sector. So we have a question here. What can corporations do to advance health equity? Are there particular policies we should advocate for or practice that we should embody? I, 
I, I think a lot of the same issues that we've talked about, sort of acknowledging the legacy, the history, um, looking inward and seeing, well, how, what kind of policies have we implemented? Uh, who's in our leadership? Do we have alternate perspectives here uh, in, in terms of diversity? Um, and there's, we didn't discuss this, but there's actually uh, really uh, outstanding science uh, a lot of it from the business uh, community uh, that diverse work teams actually do better work. Um, they, in, in science labs, they do better science, they have more productivity, more creative, more innovation. And in business, they, the, te the diverse teams tend to also uh, do better. So there, there is a, a great case to be made for this. Um, and, and, the, and, and just think of the, uh, of the lost opportunities uh, of not having uh, people come uh, into, whether it be a corporate or an academic or a government entity uh, to share, uh, uh, to be part of, of, of an effort, so. Yes. Can I just contribute that, that um, I think the question of corporate involvement in, in medical equity um, begs some address in terms of pharmaceutical companies and the structure of lobbying. Um, but that said, um, I think that one of the underlying problems with corporate presence in medical address is the question of property and privatizing, uh, uh, the, uh, privatizing access. And so I mentioned, um, you know, algorithmic uh, uh, configurations. And if they are proprietary, it's very, very hard to hold them to public account, to know actually what the metrics are that go into their analysis of black box medicine. And uh, there are some that are open source, but a great many that are not. I actually noticed in the um, question and answer period, somebody said, well, next time ask your doctor to use FRAX. Actually, my doctor was using FRAX. And FRAX is interesting because it's an international corporation based in, or company based in Britain, I believe. And they actually have a separate set of metrics for the United States. They don't ask in other countries Black or African American. <laughs> they don't have that question in analyzing or interpreting um, the osteoporosis results. And so the degree to which the United States imposes or requires um, uh, you know, what it understands to be separate populations, how we delineate those separate populations as raced, um, I think is something that needs to be um, uh, held to public account. Thank you so much. Well, we have run out of time. I would like to thank the panelists for your real insights and thoughtful presentations, and of course, the audience for your engagement. I will now turn back to Dean Galea for final remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Magania, and thank you, uh, Professors Perry Stable, Williams, and Artigo. I, I, as always, I, I, learn, I learn from each of you, and I'm learning both from your remarks, from your answers to the Q&A, and also from the audience. I, I, I think the audience participation and the chat has been remarkable. It really has been uh, wonderful to read the comments and to learn from everybody. I want to say thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, tomorrow we have the third part of the symposium. Our keynote is Senator Elizabeth Warren. And then we have a panel again like today following this. Uh, this really has been uh, a fabulous couple of days of uh, learning and listening uh, for all of us. Thank you all for being a part of it. Everybody stay well.